Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth session of our first ever open enrollment virtual summit called How to Choose Between High or Low Deductible Health Plans. We've got another minute or so until we kick things off. So we thought it was an appropriate question that as everyone's getting settled in, type into the chat if you yourself prefer high or low deductible health plans. That way you can get familiar with the chat feature and you can ask questions throughout this 45, 45 minute session as well. Um, I myself will start. I just enrolled in a high deductible health plan going into effect November 1st. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, certainly even for me, knowing so much about this topic, it was a decision that I went back and forth on uh, a little bit myself too. So feel free to chime in in the chat. Again, get comfortable, get accustomed to the chat feature. Let us know if you yourself are on a high or low deductible health plan or just which one you prefer. James says low. Claire says low. James is alluding to his family. Makes sense. Maybe you've got young ones. Clarice as well, I know, has a little one. So that's probably why she's had a high deductible plan in the past. Miriam says high deductible. Okay, we've got a good balance here. That's awesome. So if you're just popping in here, we're talking in the chat. What is your preference? High or low deductible health plan? Going to give it 20 or so seconds before we kick off the content. Christopher says high due to specialized medications. Brian says high. What's like high is winning? Interesting. Interesting. Wish we could all talk openly about it to, to figure out more about your guys' reasoning. But we're, we're going to dive into all of that today. So it's a minute past. So let's dive in. Um, again, whether this is your first session or your fourth session today, thank you so much for being here. This is the first time that we're running this open enrollment virtual summit, and we've got hundreds of registrants across all of our sessions today and tomorrow. My name is Christine. I'm the CEO of Caribou, and today I'm joined by Deb Gordon. Deb, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Thanks for having me. I am the co-director of the Alliance of Professional Health Advocates and co-founder and CEO of Umbra Health Advocacy. Uh, but my real credential for being here is I am a recovering health insurance executive, I like to say. I spent about a decade heading up marketing for a health plan that served Medicaid, Marketplace, and then ultimately Medicare enrollees. I've written a book about healthcare from the consumer side, and I contribute to Forbes and Healthy Women on topics, most, mostly topics are about insurance, access, costs, and the like. That's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us to share your wisdom in terms of this age old question of should you join a high or low deductible health plan? Um, we could end this now just by basically saying it, it depends. <laughs> That's the typical answer that you get when you're faced with a question like that. And, and it's the honest truth. Um, it's not necessarily that one is better than the other. It really does depend on the person itself, as I'm sure you've seen. That's so true. Um, in working in advocacy and because of my background in health insurance, I talk to people all the time who um, just really get stumped by this question and are uh, anxious, I would say, about making the right decision. And when I tell them there actually isn't necessarily a right decision, I can't tell sometimes if that makes them feel better or worse, like better on the one hand because you can't make a wrong decision Worse, mm -hmm. on the other hand, because I think a lot of people wish I could just tell them, you know, what's the answer? Yeah, there's this has come up already in a couple of sessions today. There's really no crystal ball to be able to predict what your healthcare utilization is going to be in the next year. And that is a really big factor that comes into this decision. So why don't we kick things off? Deb, I'll hand things over to you to kind of walk us through just the basics of what is and how is a high deductible health plan different than a low deductible health plan? 
Sure, thanks. And probably the best place to start, and this may be uh, too basic, I'm not sure, but I like to level set on what is the actual definition of a high deductible plan. And according to the IRS, it's a health insurance plan with a deductible of at least $1,500 for an individual and $3,000 for a family. That may not even sound like a lot, um, but for a lot of people, that's a lot of money. And a lot of health plans have much higher deductibles. Um, so, so if your if your deductible is fifteen hundred dollars or more, you're on a high deductible plan. Um, the other kind of I think the the sort of other way to take the basics like foundational information is how do these things work on the marketplace and and in an employer sponsored plans. So on the marketplace. Um, there is always an out-of-pocket limit or max. Um, the out-of-pocket maximum changes each year. It really, I think, only goes in one direction. It goes up. Um, this coming year, the individual out-of-pocket maximum will be $9,450 and $18,900 for a family. Um, that's up, like I said, from 9100 and. 18 to in 2023. So, you know, the deductible is just part of the story of financial exposure. Um, it's the first part, but it you're obviously financial exposure ends at the out of pocket max. In terms of marketplace plans and the deductibles, most plans have a deductible in the marketplace and it varies by um, metallic tier. So bronze plans, which I'm sure everyone here knows, covers you know less of the has lower actuarial value, covers less of the total expected healthcare spending. Um, Ninety percent of bronze plans have deductibles. Eighty-five percent of silver. Eighty-seven percent of gold plans. So even the very kind of rich benefit plans, gold. Um, and platinum, 69% of platinum plans have deductibles. So even at the most generous, most rich benefit plan levels, you're probably still facing some kind of deductible. Now, that's fine. It just sort of depends on how much is the deductible. So in the marketplace, the average bronze plan deductible is about $7,500. And the average silver plan deductible is like $5,000. So again, that is a huge amount of money that consumers have to come up with or could have to come up with if they need, uh, if they need to use services. Gold and platinum have much lower deductibles. On average, gold has $1,650 average deductible. And platinum has basically no deductible at $45. Um, sorry if I'm going out of order on the slides. No, no, uh, you're you're me. doing um, no, it's it's perfect. Um, I, I think that that's an important point to kind of touch on as we're talking about the deductible amounts. Um, just to add something in in terms of our experience working with advisors, you know, a lot of their clients are very surprised when coming from those, you know, what we would call like just richer, more comprehensive employer benefits with lower deductibles. They're used to that high deductible plan being called a high deductible when they had that $1,500 or $3,000 deductible, but then they go onto the marketplace and they're seeing a lot different costs and the, the metal tiers are all included in that. So i um, just trying to jump around to find the visuals that best suit what you're going through. Okay. Um, well, on the employer side, it's a really good point. So now, nowadays, almost everyone, just no matter what kind of health insurance you have, pretty much everyone has a deductible of some sort. So Kaiser, every year, Kaiser Family Foundation does a big survey of employee benefits, and they cover everything from, you know, what what's the average premium and the employee contribution to deductibles and cost sharing in all forms. Um, and this year, the most recent year, 2022, they should be coming out with the new one soon, I think. But the most recent data says that 88% of covered workers have a deductible of some form, and that the average deductible of people with a deductible is almost $1,800. So 
that puts the average at qualifying as a high deductible plan. Uh, there's some, some data that would suggest the average is higher, and there are some groups for whom um, the average deductible is higher. So it's, I think the point is, <laughs> if you look at the trend lines on deductibles, both the number of people who have coverage with a deductible and the amount of that deductible on average, they, it really only goes in one direction, up. Um, how am I doing? Do I, can I kick it back to you? Or? Fantastic. Yeah, Deb, I, I actually have an example to, to highlight exactly what we're talking Perfect. about here. So on, on this health planning analysis, this is a client that we worked with, uh, a client of a financial advisor. It's a very common scenario that we walk clients through that's basically outlining how is my employer coverage going to differ once I retire and also throw COBRA into the mix of that, which is a continuation of my existing employer benefits for a comparison too. So we're actually gonna start on the right side of this chart and I'll walk you through exactly what this is illustrating to this client and, and to this advisor as well, because this is very, very closely tied to the financial plan. If clients are wanting to retire before they are Medicare eligible, they need to take these specific costs into account. And truth be told, everyone's individualized costs are very different, whether that's because of their own unique healthcare needs, whether it's because of how big their family is and how many people they need to cover, or if you're coming from the last session that we just ran, where you live has a really big impact in terms of your costs as well. So here on the right-hand side, we see this Aetna plan. And this is the employer plan. This client's paying about $588 a month. Their out-of-pocket maximum is quite high. The deductible is not built into this chart, but this was a high deductible health plan, as you can see here in the name, in the blue uh, row header. And all in every year, they paid about $7,000. But to jump on what Deb was saying, that maximum exposure, that total risk in a given year could be up to about 18,000 if you consider the potential out-of-pocket costs. When they continue that coverage post-employment on COBRA, that premium is now three times as much. So you can see here the employer was covering a really big chunk of it, but now the client is actually left to pay that all themselves. They actually pay 100% plus 2% administration fee on top of what they used to pay. So if your clients are contemplating retirement and they want to you know, do some snooping around in terms of what their COBRA coverage might cost them, they can either approach their HR department or if they don't wanna do that, they can find out how much in percentage the employer is subsidizing and do that calculation themselves. The out-of-pocket maximum doesn't change. So your fixed costs go up and then you add in that out-of-pocket maximum. Now the client's risk has doubled. Um, you know, here we see a really, really big difference in terms of what they could spend in a given year on healthcare. On the marketplace, it looks a little bit different in a few ways. Here we see actually a little bit lower of a premium in this specific case. This is a bronze plan. It was a high deductible health plan as well. And you now have a much larger out-of-pocket maximum. So that follows the trends of what Deb was mentioning. We're seeing these higher out-of-pocket maximums. They're really only going one way. They're going up. It's in the 18,000s this year in terms of the maximum amount that we can expect. And so the fixed fees are a little bit lower, but total risk is a little bit higher. So that's where you can have now a conversation with your client to be able to determine what makes the most sense for you. Do you want to pay a little bit more on a monthly basis? And then maybe we can reduce your total risk. Or do we want to perhaps do the reverse situation? And now you have numbers you can speak to. And of course, you want to consider the actual quality of that coverage as well within all of that too. So generally speaking, um, and Deb, I'd love your, your take on this as well. When it comes to picking that higher deductible health plan, that bronze plan, typically it's ideal for people who have lower healthcare utilization, like less out-of-pocket costs that they could incur because they are going to, they're probably more likely to accrue those additional services. Is, is that right? Would you say the same? Yeah. I mean, I think for low deductible, sorry, for high deductible plans, you're kind of betting 
that you're not going to need a lot of services. Um, if you do, you're going to be paying for them, you know, 100% up until that deductible. So you definitely have to, um, I would say, have a positive, optimistic outlook or hopefully evidence to, you know, back that up that you're not going to need, you shouldn't need a lot of services in the coming year and or, you know, enough cash on hand or enough access to resources mm -hmm. that if you do wind up needing something unexpected, you can absorb it. I think low deductible plans, you started to say, you know, as folks were uh, filtering in, you know, low deductible plans are really designed for people who are, who know they have, you know, likely a lot of health needs or, or will use a lot of services and, or I would add just are risk averse and would rather know, you know, that more of their needs will be covered if they need to use their benefits. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've seen, again, those, those risk averse individuals who might be perfectly healthy, but on a low deductible health plan as well, just, just for exactly what you mentioned, that's just their preference. And so making sure that advisors, you are addressing that risk tolerance factor as well with clients is really, really important. And, you know, related to the point around higher healthcare utilization for high deductible health plans, all preventative services are covered at 100% by the plan and your deductible does not apply. And um, this list is often larger than traditional plans too. So you might have some additional services that might be covered as well by the plan at 100% that don't actually go into your deductible. So that is something worth considering. For example, there's some here listed on this slide. So you might have some additional benefits that you can tap into, even if you are a higher healthcare utilizer, but you wanna make sure directly with the plan that that is in fact the case. I think a lot of this too comes down to, you know, the fear, the concern and the anxiety that you mentioned. It, it, it comes down a lot of times to, lack of understanding of the actual infrastructure in terms of how health insurance works and the cost sharing uh, between you as the consumer and the uh, carrier itself. So Deb, I thought it would be, you know, again, just to level set and get everyone here on the exact same page in terms of um, these, this terminology to, to actually walk people through this in very, very simple English. And, and maybe it can help advisors explain these exact same terms to their clients that way as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are probably, I don't know, a dozen or so key terms that really kind of shape somebody's health insurance experience and, and influence their costs. And, the, but, you know, and most people don't really understand them. Uh, so premium is the monthly cost or the set amount. You're basically buying your health insurance coverage with the premium. Um, the deductible we've talked a lot about is the amount you pay, you the consumer pays before health insurance kicks in, basically. And I think a lot of people do know that the deductibles are from your car insurance. You may know if you if you have a small fender bender, you're going to be paying for it yourself. If you total your car, it might be worth asking your insurance to step in. It's it's not dissimilar in healthcare, but health health insurance deductibles are a lot more complicated most people don't fully understand what counts towards the deductible you just made a great point about preventive services that you could you know you have access to um, that maybe don't don't contribute to the deductible there are also many wrinkles um Oh, you're trying to have me sim help simplify, and I'm making it more complicated. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, deductible. The the basic concept is like this is the amount you have to pay before insurance will start covering. Um, and I just think it's really worth digging into that in your own uh, plan options to make sure you understand what counts, who's covered by it, how you know, do you have a family collective aggregate deductible? Is there a separate deductible for that you have to satisfy just for prescription. So, so it's just, it's a kind of basic concept, but the devil's in the details. And then I think coinsurance is one that really trips most people up. And if you look at, there are many surveys done over the last, you know, five or 10 years that just show that most people don't know 
all for premium deductible copayment and coinsurance. So maybe m most people know what a copay is. Almost nobody has no has really fully understood what coinsurance is. Coinsurance is like a copayment, but instead of a set fee that you pay, pay when you use services, it's a percent of the bill that you pay. So maybe after you meet your deductible, you pay 20% coinsurance on XYZ service, hospitalization or whatever kind of service. And you actually don't know what that's going to be. You might know the percentage, but you don't know what you'll have to pay until you know what the total bill is. So it's, it's uh, legitimate that these are not well understood, that most people get confused by them because even if you understand the word, which many people don't, it's hard to know how does it really affect you specifically? Yeah, I think or a lot of the times, or better. No, that's, no, that's better. I was just going to add that a lot of the time you need to like go through almost a traumatic experience for it to really stick, <laughs> which is unfortunate, but yeah. it, it, it can be really true that you need to experience, you know, a large medical bill and then you're stuck with a percentage instead of a fixed amount. And then you finally kind of sets in as to what that really means. Um, in your experience, and I think there's a lot of data that that backs this up too, like very, very few people can define those four terms, co-insurance, co-pay, premium, and deductible. And education, um, just like in financial literacy, you know, the more financially literate you are, um, the less likely you are to overspend. I think the, the same is really true in terms of what we've seen in, in healthcare as well. Absolutely. And there is, I've seen surveys that range from literally 4% of people can define those terms accurately mm -hmm. up to maybe half, but it, it, that's not good either. You know, half of yeah. Americans being unsure of yeah. what the terminology means, that's not very good. And I will say it, it does matter in health insurance. There's other data that um, there's a study in JAMA from 2018 that shows that people with lower health insurance literacy tend to avoid care that they even care that they need and even care that they that they would be covered for. So the wow. implications are pretty serious um, because if you don't understand what something's going to cost you, you might not go get the care you need for fear, you know, that you won't be able to afford it and and maybe you actually have full coverage for those services. So mm -hmm. it really behooves people to learn the basics and at least know how to ask the questions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so, sorry for sidetracking a little bit. Uh, a couple more terms that might be helpful. Uh, we get asked questions a lot around in and out of network services. Um, as clients are retiring and losing their employer benefits, a lot of the times they lose access to PPO plans. There's lots of states on the market plan on the marketplace that don't offer PPOs. So walk, if you could, our listeners through, you know, what does it mean to be in and out of network? And if you're able to tie anything into the mix around PPOs and HMOs and kind of what that means, I think that would be really helpful too, because that is definitely a key consideration as clients are retiring, as well as on Medicare, by the way, sure. with advantage as an option and having those networks. Absolutely. And I think, thank you for tying those things together because in and out of network, um, it absolutely does matter what kind of plan you're on. So if, you're, if your providers, your doctors, your clinics, your hospitals are in network, it means they've contracted with the health plan to provide services for health plan members at set rates. That's a negotiation between the health plan and the provider. I used to sit right next to the head of contract, contracting and network management for the health plan I worked at. So I would hear, you know, through the wall, all the negotiations that went in. So that's really the sort of, that's the in-network providers are who, who the health plan wants you to go see. They've made special arrangements. They've got negotiated rates. You're, you're good to go for the most part. Out of network, is you know the concept of a provider who hasn't contracted with your health plan. And if you're on an HMO, you may not be able to get coverage for those providers at all. If you're on a PPO or a you know sort of less restrictive plan design, 
you might be able to go out of network, but you'll probably have to pay more uh, to access those providers that aren't in network. Um, that may be fine, that may be good enough, or it may be uh, you know, insurmountable costs. But on an HMO, which a lot of, you know, the a lot of HMOs are, I'm gonna say cheaper in air quotes, they have tend to have lower premiums not always, but lower premiums, uh, that isn't necessarily cheaper if you want to see, a, or if you need to see an out of network provider and you can't get permission to do so, you're going to be either choosing a different provider or paying the full cost on your own. That becomes something that we uh, or that clients tend to be uh, very surprised to learn, especially if they've lived, for example, New York, New Jersey area, Connecticut, very accustomed to crossing state lines uh, for, for care and seeing doctors in different states. That can, again, become very, very challenging once you are uh, no longer employed, might not have a PPO available to you. And these providers don't contract with the plans that are available to you in your local county. So lots to kind of get accustomed to as you're transitioning from those employer plans onto the marketplace or even employer plans onto Medicare if your clients are looking at Medicare Advantage options. Original Medicare is designed a little bit differently and those networks don't necessarily apply. About 98% of doctors and hospitals accept Medicare and the Medigap plan as payment in full. So you don't have to worry about those, um, those potential networks, but on Medicare Advantage, you more, most certainly do. So in terms of the last term here, the out-of-pocket max, uh, bring us home before we kind of tie, tie this all into HSAs, which I'm sure uh, a lot of advisors here listening are very, very accustomed to. Sure. So the out-of-pocket max is, I, I would call it the cap. You know, this is what a consumer will have to pay between all the co-payments, co-insurance, um, deductible payments in a, in a given year. So um, you showed on the slide before how, you know, the, the premium might be one thing and the deductible might be another. And then the out-of-pocket max is is yet another thing. And so basically after you meet your deductible, you're still paying, the consumer is still paying the cost sharing until they reach this cap, the out-of-pocket maximum, at which point the plan should pick up 100% of the cost for covered services provided by in-network providers. There's no, um, no guarantee and you wouldn't expect a plan to necessarily cover um, to pick up the cost if the service isn't covered or if it's a service that requires prior authorization, you have to get approval before they'll cover it. Uh, but if you have um, if you have met the out of pocket maximum, which means you know you've spent these numbers, I can't see them, but a lot of money out of your own pocket, only then does the health plan pick up the full cost of covered services. Yeah, it is most definitely a lot of money, I think, for anyone, um, especially on the marketplace. And again, just so important um, re and related to the financial plan for all the financial advisors attending today, you know, a lot just um, throw twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 as that gap year, like a, an amount of potential spending in that gap year between employment and Medicare eligibility for clients. I will tell you, sometimes that is not enough. Uh, you know, those were a couple examples that we outlined that had costs above $30,000. Uh, not to say that you should just increase those numbers, but <laughs> what's really helpful is doing that detailed analysis on a per client basis as you're helping them think through and plan for their retirement. So now that we've talked uh, a little bit about the differences between a high and low deductible health plan, we've got some great baseline terminology. We're, we're all on the same page. You know, a lot of individuals opt in for the high deductible health plan because of the opportunities that is presented with the health savings account. So the pre-tax contributions for 2024 have come out if you haven't seen them already. It's uh, 4150 for individuals and 8300 for fam families. And I'm sure everyone here knows about the triple tax benefits. Contributions are tax deductible. Savings grow tax deferred. 
and withdrawals for HSA eligible expenses are all tax free. A lot of advisors that I talk to love, love, love HSAs, but what they omit from the conversation with their clients is tying it back to that healthcare utilization piece that we just went through and ensuring that the actual tax savings vehicle being the HSA also aligns with the actual healthcare utilization and needs of the client. Can't just make this decision in a silo by saying, you know, it'd be great to be on a high deductible health plan, throw some money um, into the savings account and you're on your way. You really need to make sure, again, like Deb was saying, that there is that money tucked away to cover the deductible, to cover the higher out-of-pocket max as well, in case there are any um, additional needs of the client as they're on this high high deductible plan. Uh, the catch-up contribution hasn't changed. It's still about $1,000 uh, going from those from 55 until 65. And you need to stop contributing to the HSA uh, about six months before your enrollment. If the client is still working, they have to waive their Medicare Part A to continue to contribute to uh, the HSA account. So that can also become a very big factor in the decision making of enrolling in Part A. Some employers, for example, mandate it. If you're still on the employee benefits, they might say you need to enroll in Part A in which case you need to stop contributing to that high deductible health plan. So it's an area that you um, don't wanna play around with. It's all uh, governed by the IRS. And so you wanna make sure that you are following these rules very, very, very carefully um, as you're walking clients through this really important decision. And here you can see, we have another example. It's a little bit more comprehensive than the last table I showed you. And I'll walk you through some of the different options here available to this client that we worked with. In this first column here, you can see it is a lower cost HMO option and it's an HSA eligible health plan. Um, as Deb mentioned, you know, the HMO is usually uh, less expensive. In the case of this example, it is uh, not by much actually as, as you go into the EPO potential option, but certainly in compared to the PPO, it's actually about half the price in terms of a monthly premium. Now on this plan, we've got a deductible of about $6,900. Again, this is the marketplace. It's gonna be a lot higher. And then we have an out-of-pocket maximum of just as much. So if you consider the estimated annual fixed costs, we've got about $3,300 in premiums and add in that out-of-pocket maximum. Now we see $10,000. So very different than that first example I showed you. That's why again, any estimations or blanket assumptions uh, really don't work in scenarios like this. There are so many specifics that go into figuring out these premiums, whether it's location or age or number of people in the household. And here you can see this $10,000 figure is a lot different than those 30,000 plus ones that I showed on the other slide. Now, if I go from this and better plan, which um, I would uh, define as being in you know a less lesser known insurance company and now I go on to the Cigna plan you can see here that I have an EPO option available to me that gives a little bit of flexibility in terms of providers premium only goes up a little bit deductible actually goes down but out-of-pocket maximum goes up so here you can see how all the factors and levers start to switch depending on uh, the plan option it's an HSA eligible option too not far off, we've got about $3,400 in estimated annual fixed costs and about 10,500 call it in maximum exposure. So that additional $400 might be well worth it to your client to lower their deductible, uh, but it will raise their out-of-pocket maximum um, by about 150 bucks. So maybe they wanna work with Cigna, maybe that's the main reason, maybe the Cigna plan covers all their doctors where the and better plan doesn't or vice versa. Again, so many different factors that come into play. And on the last column, you can actually see a lower deductible plan option, but this is a PPO. So it's about double the price. Uh, it's got a great star rating as well. Um, it's offered by Blue Cross Blue Shield. So we got a recognized carrier. Deductible's gone down to about $3,500 and the out-of-pocket max is about 85. So your month or annual fixed costs are about double, but your total risk is only increased by about four to 5,000. So these are the factors that you can actually be talking about with your clients as you're walking them through uh, all of their options as they're retiring. And you know this relates to everything that we were just talking about related to networks 
and other factors like seeing specialists, for example, uh, Deb, or prior authorizations, right? Like those are all things that I'm sure you've seen as well in your experience that impact the decision making. Is that right? Well, I think what you said before about um, it sometimes takes a bad experience to really understand that those should be factors in decision making. So I think a lot of people just look at the numbers and like we said, not even all the numbers and think they've got the gist. And then they wind up in the middle of a plan year, uh, maybe on a lower premium plan with less flexibility and realizing they need to see a specialist or they want, you know, the specialist um, that they, you know, that's best for what they need. They, they actually can't get to it. I, we work with people all the time uh, with advocacy clients who can't get to the care they really need uh, because of kind of a lockdown plan design. Um, so I think it kind of goes back to a, a few points we've already made. One is it's really hard to anticipate your future needs and most people are not that good at it, especially when it comes to our health. We just don't know what's going to happen. And then, you know, there, there, there's always a trade-off in health insurance. So you may not uh, think you care about something until you need it. And, you know, so I think it's, um, it comes down to preference. You know, there's so much uh, preference that I I wish more people would think through ahead of time. So it may cost more to have the option to see the specialist you want. Is that cost too much? Is that not important to you? Um, or is the flexibility worth something, whether or not you know for sure what you're going to need? Because actually nobody knows for sure what they're going to need. So I, I would say these should be factors in decision making, yeah. the quality of the plan, the bureaucracy, you know, I just will put a plug in for, it's really hard to know um, how easy or hard it's going to be to get approval if, you know, if there is some administrative rule or, you know, prior auth requirement for a specific service, medication or provider. Uh, and maybe the best approximation of that, how easy or hard is it to work with the health plan, would be the NCQA ratings every year. The National Committee for Quality Assurance comes out with a rating. I just covered this for Forbes, um, their 2023 oh. ratings. And there are measures in there for every plan that's, that submits data that uh, indicates how easy is it for current plan members to get the care they need? And so you you won't know if you're gonna get approved for what, you know, so for a prior authorization request, but you can get a gauge for how easy or hard do current members think it is to work with that plan. And that's such a great point. And just so that our listeners know, those star ratings are different than the ones published by the actual plan themselves, right, Dad? Um, I think that depends. So Medicare has its own star rating system. NCQA has its own star rating system. And then the plans, it really depends where they're accredited and what, what measures they value most, what they might be putting forward. Awesome. If you have a link um, to that Forbes piece that you had, um, feel free to drop it into the chat if it's not too much trouble to find it. Uh, or we sure. can make sure that, no, that we no share problem. it as well with everyone that watched. That way they can, uh, you know, share that as a resource to clients. I typically like to tell our clients, you know, any um, resource that ends in .gov is always the best resource. But certainly pieces like Forbes as well are going to publish probably pretty credible data uh, when it, as it relates to this. So thank you. Uh, that link is now in the chat if you're curious. Um, and it's a well worth plug to be able to uh, hopefully share that information with with all of our viewers today. So in, in our experience, you know, with HSAs, there are a lot of misconceptions about HSAs. These are some of the questions that we get asked most by clients. So as an adv advisor, we thought that it would be helpful to kind of share this information with you to put yourself in the shoes of your client and, you know, provide them with this information in the event that they're maybe too afraid to ask you these questions. We were talking in our first session today, uh, it was a panel that I was running 
about the advisor being the person to prompt the questions, not necessarily waiting for your clients to come to you with the questions. And, you know, our, one of our panelists, Jennifer, said, as advisors, we just need to be asking better questions. If we think that our clients don't want to talk to us about healthcare, one of their top expenses, then we're not asking them good questions. So here's a little bit of an insight into what this typically looks like in terms of questions that we get from financial advisors' clients. The first is, will the health insurance company see my tax status or income? No, this is all managed by the RIS. Do I need to use up my HSA every year? No, you don't. That's often what's called a flexible spending account. That's more like a wallet. You get a certain amount of credit that you use every single year and you will lose it if you don't use it. But that isn't true of a health savings account. Do I lose my HSA if I switch to a low deductible plan? No, again, you can continue to use it, meaning that you can draw from it, but you just can't contribute. So your HSA, actually, you can hold on to it. Um, even if you're not on that low deductible health plan. In addition to that, a lot of clients ask us about what qualifies as a medical expense. And this is all outlined by the RAS as well. And you can use your money in your HSA for these qualified medical expenses, and they're not considered uh, a taxable distribution. Uh, you can use it for yourself with individual coverage or family if you are enrolled in a family plan, but it's really important that you're actively enrolled in either that individual or family plan. I'm not going to list all of these out right now for the sake of time, but you could take a screenshot or again, the IRS does have this list published. Some of the highlighted ones are some of the most common ones that we do get questions around. And uh, this list actually expanded uh, during the pandemic. And it include things like, for example, eye drops or face masks as well. So you can look up the CARE Act and look at those additional qualified medical expenses that also apply now, as well as some HSA eligible over-the-counter medications um, like antifungal or anti-itch products, for example, just to name a couple um, things that clients might have in mind. There are some services, though, that could require a letter of medical necessity, such as just to give examples, breast implant removal procedure, electronic toothbrush. The list for these three categories is quite long. So if you are getting questions from clients or you know that certain clients are asking you about certain services, again, fantastic resources online. Government resources are typically the most credible to be able to find information about these qualified medical expenses. A lot of clients also want to know how exactly to use the HSA and all HSAs come with a card. If you've never had one yourself, you can let your client know that they do come with a card and you can hand it over just like a credit card when you're paying for these qualified expenses. Um, some do provide checkbooks. I think this is becoming more and more rare and it could cost you something if you are looking to get um, a potential checkbook with you. So the wallet card is the easiest or you can submit claims after the expense as well. You can always do, again, as you're purchasing or retroactively. If you are given an HSA provider from your employer, that might be the only option that you have. You can ask them, um, usually because they are contracting with one provider directly, that might be what you're stuck with. But on the marketplace, there will be partnerships and options based on the carrier. So you can typically shop around. So it is worthwhile to look for a potential different HSA provider if you are wanting to explore that for whatever reason that might be. And in addition to that, consider the tax savings as well that come along with that as you are offering, you know, hopefully a, a comprehensive healthcare planning strategy to your clients and potentially a tax planning strategy along with that, you know, in our software itself, we do have a, um, tax savings calculator for those who do have an HSA account, if they do give us access to that information, we can provide a small tax savings calculation to let them know uh, what potential savings they could incur by being on that plan. And with that, we're, we're almost at the hour. Deb, any kind of last wise words that you wanna share with the audience as, as we conclude this awesome educational session um, about a very, very important debate and question that we get a lot around high and, and low deductible health plans. Well, I just pop into the chat and see if we got any questions and anything else you want to share. Sure. I would just say I, I've sort of made this point, but I think that 
Um, you know, I'm all of my work is and all my intentions are to really think about the consumer first. And so when you really put the consumer first, like any and all is valid. There might be data. There is a lot of data on, you know, who should get a high deductible or a low deductible plan and what's the better or worse plan, not the right or the wrong plan, but better or worse economically. And I think it, that's all really important and consumers really need that guidance because it's too hard to figure it out. And at the end of the day, consumer preference goes a long way to making uh, one plan over another be the right plan. Uh, so I always give a lot of weight and stock to consumer preference, even if uh, the rational economic decision might be different. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I spent a lot of time in previous roles as well, um, fighting. I often felt like a fight, you know, fighting on the behalf of, of the consumer to get certain services covered. I think with a lot of education, like what, what we went through today, a lot of people can hopefully make a lot more educated and confident and clear decisions. And even if you can't predict what's going to come down the pike in the next year, you know, open enrollment is the unlock season where you can potentially just realign and reassess your coverage. So um, for Medicare, it starts in a couple of weeks. Those plans are actually already released. So clients and, and you as their advisor can start shopping around for the marketplace. Doesn't start till November 1st and those plans aren't yet released, but this is your opportunity. So uh, hopefully you get the opportunity to speak with your clients about reassessing and realigning their coverage. and putting them first and making sure they have the education to, to make that confident and clear decision. And with that, Deb, thank you so, so much for um, doing this session with us, sharing your knowledge. It was great to have, have you here and, and walk through your experience. Uh, thank you again. Thanks for having me. Have a great day, yeah. everyone. Thank you, everyone. We're going to be kicking off our last session of the day, Open Enrollment 101, in about 15 minutes time, so 12.15 uh eastern or pacific time 3 15 eastern time hopefully we'll see you there that session does qualify it's approved for one ce credit see you there thanks again deb